Hey y'all, it's Jeremiah Johnson with my great friend Brian Guerin. We're so excited to announce the launch of a new e-course called Pure and Simple Hearted Devotion to Jesus. We're just sensing the urgency of the hour to draw a generation into the secret place and really love Jesus with everything that they've got. Yeah, I believe the highest prize in life is to love Jesus and so honored to do it with you, man. I believe it's gonna bless you guys immensely. You're gonna get practical tools. You're gonna get insight, conversations with Brian and I. It's gonna bless you. Join now. Well, there's definitely some things I feel like the Lord has specifically spoken to me about this group tonight. Welcome to all of our online people. Welcome to our online students. Love you guys. Love having you guys. Um, as Jeremiah said, I'm an instructor at the Altar School of Ministry, and, and Chad talked some about that. Listen, the Lord is encountering us powerfully. He is, he is digging up 
some of the places inside of hearts. He's coming in with fresh truth and, and revelation. And as, as Chad was saying, that sometimes we can think, okay, well, I've got that and I've done this forever. I mean, we, we have people that are senior pastors um, that are online students. We have um, people that are business owners. We have stay-at-home moms. We have just people all over the spectrum um, that have known the Lord for a long time. But here's what I believe. It's not just about have I ever gone to a ministry school. We have people who have been in ministry schools and are coming. It's what is the Lord doing? It's recognizing when God has a new season and he's breathing something new and understanding there's fresh revelation and fresh manna in this new season and saying, I'm so thankful for all that he poured out in a past season, but if he is doing something new and there's fresh revelation being poured out, then I want to stay current with the move of God and what he's doing. And so I just encourage you, if the Lord is is moving on your heart some, um, you can see in your bulletin, we're going to have an open house. You can come, hear more about that, hear some of the teaching. And see if that's something the Lord is calling you to. Um, I just really want to thank and honor Jeremiah and Morgan. Um, I, I know that it's a privilege to be up here. It's not something that I take lightly. Um, they are, uh, they, I'm, I'm some of their biggest fans. And um, here's the thing. Um, I cannot, I, I grew up in the fact I'm too much of a truth lover and a justice person. I cannot stand fake. And not only fake, like, I mean, authentically has to be that what we are saying is being completely modeled. I cannot, there's just something in me that just, uh, can't take anything contaminated whatsoever. I'm not saying that I'm perfect in any way, but just in the way of I can't, I literally cannot play the games of we're going to do all this and there's anything behind the scenes at all that's dishonoring to the Lord. And I can tell you that um, there's probably few people who have seen into the back end of their life like I have, the things that we've walked through together. And I'm telling you right now, they are the real deal. They're the real deal. They love each other more than you even hear about. They love their family more than you even hear about. They love the Lord more than you even know and see. And that is at home, in services, wrestling with hard decisions that they've had to make. And they're committed to the ways of the Lord. They're committed to each other. They're committed to their family. And so I just, I honor them. I love them. And um, I'm thankful to have the opportunity tonight. So, all right. You guys ready to jump in? I also want to say hi to some of my family that's watching. I am um, one of seven kids. And so... Um, all of my family, all of my eight nieces and nephews, all of them were in Florida, are in Florida. And so it was, it was a very bittersweet thing um, to move up here. I miss them a lot, um, but I also know that the Lord is doing something. And that's where when Chad is talking about people moving and feeling that stirring in our hearts, um, every single one of us that are here are not from here. So every single one of us have answered that call as well. And uh, all right. All right. Well, tonight we're going to talk a little bit. So usually in class I teach about an hour and a half. So we good with that? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm like, man, this is going to seem so short now after classes. But the students are probably like, thank God. Um, <laughs> so we're going to jump in tonight. I... Um, it's, it's funny, actually, Jeremiah had asked me to speak last month, and um, that was a plan. The Lord was giving me something that I was feeling a stirring on, and then I ended up getting sick and couldn't do it. And so um, he asked me then to speak this month, and, and I was like, okay, awesome. I'm going to go back and start, like, what was in the boiler? I'll just go get that out and keep going. And the Lord was like, oh, no, that was so last month. Welcome to Prophetic Person's Life. 
to where you're like, I started working on something, so this will help me out as a little bit of a cheat sheet the next time. And the Lord was like, oh, man, that was so September. It has nothing to do with it right now. So um, as I began to seek the Lord, I felt that specifically uh, the group here tonight, I felt like the Lord was saying, you're going to be speaking some to a remnant. And also beyond this, in wrestling a lot in prayer, as the Lord said, this is what I want you to share on, um, I found way more time he was calling me actually to the place of prayer and fasting in this than just preparing the notes itself. And I felt like it was because um, the message that he was telling me, which is, I tell my students this and then for some reason they don't believe me, but um, it's really simple. (laughs) It's really simple. It's very, very, very simple. But I believe that the Lord is breathing a fresh revelation on very simple things. And as I was as I was beginning to, you know, type things out, I would literally have to stop in the middle of some of these things as I would feel a wrestle in the spirit and I'd have to go get on my face and pray for a period of time as I felt that wrestle in the spirit where the Lord was talking about tilling the soil and I felt like he was saying that um, we, when uh, Tammy and Jeremiah and I, we always um, pray before these services earlier in the week. And as we were praying, he referenced that last night as the message that the Lord gave him. And, and um, as, we, as we were even praying, the Lord gave me um, the passage about the dry bones, but he gave it to me in a different way. It wasn't just prophesied of dry bones. It was more seeing there was a skeleton of the movement, but that the Lord wanted to bring the sinews and the flesh and the breath and just keep bringing things to add on to it and bringing it into the fullness of what the Lord wanted. And so as I was praying into this, I felt like the Lord was saying, the wrestle that you're feeling in prayer isn't just speaking only to the people in here and online, but it's speaking into a movement of things that I want to interject and the pieces that I'm continuing to bring alongside because um, we, we, we know in part right now, and the Lord has set a lot of foundation, but there's more and more and more that he's wanting to inject and bring about until it comes into the fullness of what he's desiring. Amen? Amen. So tonight we're going to be talking about um, the coming baptism of love. So you got grace last night. And you're getting love tonight. What is this? I thought this was the altar global. What in the world? Um, And so we're going to be talking a little bit about this. And like I said, it's something very simplistic. But I felt like the Lord was very much like, "This, this has to be a foundational part of an end time movement. Or we've missed the whole thing. If we get everything else, I mean, it almost sounds like a passage of scripture. If we get everything else, 1 Corinthians 13, if we speak with the tongues of men and angels, we get the Holy Spirit encounters, we give our lives to the flames, to the poor. If we get everything else and miss this foundational piece, we actually miss the whole thing. And it's so simple, we'll hit some things tonight, but there's so many different reasons of why that this loses the foundation. And so many times we don't even realize, sometimes there's an aversion to it because of how it's being distorted and polluted. Jeremiah hit that last night with grace. We're going to hit that some tonight with love. Sometimes we think it's so simple and and we want to, you know, we get sucked up in a movement sometimes of the most mysterious is the most spiritual and we're just going to get rid of those, you know, whatever things that anyone can do that. That's not really, it's, it's the people who God super loves who gets all of these crazy big things up here and there's so many reasons and so my hope tonight is not to give something that is actually that profound but it's to ask the Holy Spirit to breathe a revelation in our hearts again on something that is so simple so that we're not like Jesus coming as a baby in a manger. We're not so offended with the simplicity of God 
that we end up missing the entire point altogether. Amen. So my students know I love the Holy Spirit. We just went through an entire session of Jesus' introduction to the person of the Holy Spirit in John 14 and John 16. I love him, and there's literally nothing we can do tonight. We can say things and be intellectually stimulated, but our hearts cannot be moved tonight without the person of the Holy Spirit breathing upon us tonight. Amen? Amen. So can we just put our hands out in a receiving posture before the Lord for a moment? Holy Spirit, I want to honor you corporately and publicly tonight. So right now I'm asking that you would move in a deeper way in our hearts right now. Holy Spirit, you're so good at going into those places that I thought I already knew. And breathing something fresh upon my heart. I'm asking in this room and online, God, that you would begin to breathe a fresh wind. I'm asking that every distraction would be removed. I'm asking that Jesus would be honored and glorified in this place. I'm asking for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you to be released all throughout this room and the airwaves in Jesus' name. I see we honor you tonight, Holy Spirit. We give you full permission and authority. You run the show. You do what you want to do. You veered where you want to veer. You call what you want to call. You speak what you want to speak. And you sing what you want to sing. It's your place tonight. We will go where you want to go. We honor you as the leader and the shepherd tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. All right, so I want to build just a little foundation before we head on um, where we're going to end up landing on tonight, which is the coming baptism of love. I want to lay a little foundation beforehand <clears throat> of why we're talking about this and why this matters. I feel like sometimes if we just jump into it, then it just, just feels like that same old thing. So though there are so many things that are important and matter in our walk, we often we find I find we often stop with something being true rather than finding the priority and placement that the word gives to that truth. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we end up often having a lot of pieces of a house that get put in any place for the building rather than realizing that the building, that in building a house, it doesn't just take the right pieces, it takes the right order. There are certain things that can't rightly be put into place until more foundational pieces go before it. Okay, so let's say we've gathered all of the materials. Any construction people in here? Any? All right. So let's say that we've gathered all of the materials to build a house, and they're all in this pile over here. We have everything that we need, all right? They're all pieces of that house. Every single one of them matters, and every single one of them are needed for the house to come into full completion, right? You guys with me? 
But here's the thing. We can't take windows and put them into the hole that's been dug, right? We can't take the rafters and put them as the floorboards, correct? We can't take different parts and pieces and simply stack them any way that we want to stack them and say, well, that's a house. No, it's, it's not really a house. But all of those things are pieces of the house. Absolutely. But it's not just the pieces of the house that matter. The pieces have to be put in their correct order for the house to be fully realized as a house. Correct? Like I said, super simple. But we're going to go somewhere. So in the same way, a lot of times, this is what we do with truth. We take truth and we take pieces of truth. And the fact is, it's true. The, the, all of the pieces of truth are all true. Okay? So they all matter. But here's the thing. The Lord, and we're going to see some scripture, the Lord has a certain order that the truth has to be built on in order for the full thing that, he's be, that he is building to rightly be realized. Amen? You often, therefore, have many in conservative movements that will never move on from the foundation to see the entire house completed. However, you also then have those, a lot of times in the charismatic movement, that tend to love all of the trimmings without a huge concern for the foundation and the blueprint as to why each piece must be laid. Okay, I talk a lot about this. So Jeremiah was talking about ditches last night. My students know I love giving the radical middle of, okay, we love to call this out, but guys, <laughs> that's why I love speaking to a remnant. It's easy for us to call out what we're not, but typically the Lord is a little less interested in that, and he's a little more interested on awesome, but where is that in you, in me, right? So yeah, yeah, man, this denomination and this and that and all that, and they just won't move on from the foundation. And, and, and yes, the Lord wants to do more. But then sometimes on another side of things, we're so concerned with all of the trimmings and all of, the, all of these kinds of things that it's not even putting the foundation and the blueprints rightly in place. Amen? Are we okay tonight to just agree to allow the Holy Spirit, however he wants to step on our toes, that he can step on our toes? Listen, let me, let me at least encourage you with this. There is no one in this room, let me just tell you, there is no one in this room, however much the Lord steps on your toes tonight, there is no one in this room that will have their toes stepped on more than the Lord stepped on my toes to become this message tonight. Amen? Is that encouraging? I don't get to just prepare something. I literally have to go through as much of it as anybody else does. And so we're going to jump in and let him do what he wants to do. When it comes to the subject of the end times and end time messengers, we can be the chief offenders of this. Just like a house is not enough to know, just like a house, it's not enough to know a truth. You have to know the order in which to lay. The word of God, in a sense, gives different priority to different truths in the sense that certain truths cannot accurately be applied without first establishing the truths that go before it. Like I said, I know it's simple, but we're going somewhere. You guys still with me? All right. Hebrews 6.1 talks about this. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. 
All right, so in this, this passage and in this next one, 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. All right, so these are just some of the passages that are showing us that the word itself says what I'm basically saying. It's saying, listen, there is a foundation and then there are other truths beyond that. Like I said, sometimes in the charismatic we get, yeah, beyond that. Yes, Paul was saying we need to move on to some away from just the elementary, but it's because there was the assumption that all of the elementary things were already laid. And then Paul says this about Jesus. I, I've told my students before that Paul says, I'm going to come in. So Paul writes two-thirds of the New Testament and comes in with all of the epistles and, and all of this, right? He comes in with all of these things, but he's saying right here, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ, so we hold Paul in high respect and regard just like we should, but even he out of his own mouth is saying, even with all the truth I'm giving you, the assumption is all the truth that Jesus has laid down is already the foundation of your life. And now you're taking what I'm talking about and you're building on top of the foundation of Jesus. Amen. So the word, I'm just trying to be clear. It's important to me not just to say things, but for you to see it in the word of where we're going. So things, concepts like trading gifting for character, though giftings matter. Prioritizing the gifts over the fruit, though the gifts are good things. These are all examples that we are familiar with when it comes to people not properly building on the correct foundation. Again, gifts matter. All of those things are good, but we understand, going back to this, that there is a proper order. When we talk about the last days, we often talk about major points of it that matter, but do we really get to the foundation of what matters first? Because the Bible instructs this. Listen, I encourage us, don't just take truth see how the bible builds the truth there is a there is a definite priority when you read through the word it's not god likes this truth and he doesn't like that one it's all truth and it's all jesus but he builds a foundation a certain way and we when we skip over certain ones and then go to other ones sometimes there's faultiness in our structure So Joel 2 talks about the last days and prophesies an incredible move of the spirit that we should contend for. Amen? Amen? Well, I hope so. Man, we've been going after it on Monday nights of a move of the spirit. So am I, am I with the right people? We want to move of the spirit? Okay. Praise the Lord. Man, we might need to switch the message right there. Y'all need to help me out. So Joel 2 prophesies an end time move of the spirit that is extremely important and we should be contending for it. But Matthew 7, through 23 also says this, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What's going on there? Is prophecy part of truth? Is casting out demons part of truth? Is mighty works part of truth? All of these things, actually, we could use a whole lot more of it in Jesus-loving believers. Amen? A whole lot more of it. So are all of those things truth? Are all of those things prophesied that we're going to have more of it in the last days? Okay, then what's the issue? The issue is, is that pieces of truth were taken and applied 
without foundational truth being put in place first. Not okay. It doesn't cut it in the end. Let's look at another one. You guys ready for another one? All right. John prophesies in the book of John and Revelation that there will be, come on, we're going we're gonna to get on our toes a little bit, that there will be a bride without spot or wrinkle, and we should cry out for that. Amen? Okay, yeah, because if you're not saying amen to that, then maybe you're brand new and have never heard of anything in this room whatsoever, and somebody dragged you in here, and you have no internet and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm glad I got a good amen off of that. It's something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I can pray about for a long period of time. It's something that matters tremendously to the heart of God. Amen? Amen. But, wait, there's more. John 5, 39. Jesus is saying, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Mark 3, 6, about that passage, is part of that passage in a different way. And it actually tells us that the Jews that Jesus was speaking to were the Pharisees. Okay? The leaders of religious morality. The ones who were more holy than everyone around them. Right? And yet somehow... They are the moral standard of the day, the holiest people around, and yet somehow Jesus says to them, you search the scriptures, you're doing all the rules, all the rules, just right. For in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, a.k.a., but you're totally missing it. You're missing the foundation of the whole thing. Does holiness matter? Yeah. The word says without it, we don't see God. It matters. This is not about pitting one thing against another. I I, I hear that a lot in messages. Like in order to make my message sound more important, I'm going to diminish truths of the Bible. That's not what this is. This is every aspect of that house is needed, but the Lord is clear of the way that that house needs to be built. And in this, he is talking to the moral leaders following all the rules of the day and saying, you're searching all of the holy things, and yet you've completely missed it. Them, not us, not us, them, them. When we begin to accept the enemy's tactic of pitting truth and holiness against God's true love, we have the greatest chance of actually becoming the most religious. I'm going to say that again. Because here's the thing. We feel that religion, I'm just getting honest, and uh, hear, hear me again. There is no one in this room the Lord has been dealing with more than me. <laughs> I can promise you on this message. We feel that the spirit of religion is for all those people out there and pastors that will not yield to the Holy Spirit in a service. That's what the spirit of religion is, Right? We need to yield to the person of the Holy Spirit in our services. I was going to hit on that, but that was so September. So here we are in October, apparently. Matters. But I'm going to show us that actually we can focus on that and miss even something possibly bigger in ourselves I'm going to say that again. When we begin to accept the enemy's tactic of pitting truth and holiness 
against God's true, true love, we have the greatest chance of actually becoming the most religious. Do you want to see this in the word? Okay. I mean, because I really hope that you wouldn't take that if I just said it. Matthew 22, 37 through 40 says this. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I told you we're going real basic tonight. But then what does it say? This is an interesting statement. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Okay, let's pause there for a second. Let's pause on this verse. This is step one that's going to show us this. So we understand the two commandments. We can all quote them. First and second commandment, greatest commandment, all of that kind of stuff. Okay? So Jesus is saying, and if you look at even how the Ten Commandments are broken down, you'll see the first ones talk about our relationship with God, and the second ones talk about our relationship with people, right? Again, we're getting simple, but we're going to go somewhere. So he's saying all of the law and prophets, okay, all of the spirit and holiness, right, hangs on these two things, right? Okay, next verse, 1 John 4, 19. Uh-oh, we love him because why? All right, again, I know these are our Sunday school verses. I already know this. Let's get into the deep things of God. We love him because he first loves us. Here's the issue. When we allow the enemy to pit truth against the love of God, we can become the greatest offenders in the area of the spirit of religion. Because all of our holiness hangs on loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. However, we are told that we actually cannot love him in that way unless we receive his love. You seeing that? So all of a sudden... We can say all of that out there about the spirit of religion. But if something is growing in my heart because of the enemy trying to say, well, this is the love group and this is the truth group. And we're going to get into why. And a lot of it's because of there's been a lot of pollution. So we've tried to throw out the whole baby with the bathwater. But when we don't recognize the devices of the enemy... So we start standing against the very nature and the person of God. We actually more so fall into the spirit of religion because the entire matter of holiness surrounds loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, yet we cannot even love him one ounce unless we first allow him to pour his love into us with which we love him back. Meaning this, not being able to adequately receive the love of God causes me to possibly be the chief offender of the spirit of religion. How are we doing? I'm not mad. I get a little fired up. Yes, people desperately need to allow the spirit to move. But an equal, if not greater, offender of operating in religion are those of us who are not deeply rooted in God's love for us 
where everything flows from that place, foundation. Jesus said that all the law is fulfilled on these two commandments. First John says we love him because he first loved us. The foundation of the end time bride is not, again, please hear me. There's no pitting against, okay? We're making sure to go under maybe what we already have set well and go into some of the faulty places and sure those up. Amen? So hear me. I love probably a couple of the things that I love most is the move of the spirit and holiness, But I'm talking to a remnant tonight that also loves the move of the spirit and holiness. Amen? So I'm worried about our hearts and us in here. Because let me tell you this. A long time ago, the Lord told me when I thought me and Jesus would just exactly what Chad said. I was like, man, the church just stinks. Me and Jesus are going to go ahead and save the world. My my 22-year-old self, you know. Yeah, I got my tail kicked a little bit. Amen? Hallelujah. Um. And so the Lord said to me, Sarah, you need to go to the root because I'm a big, like, just show me. I don't need a ton. I don't need tons of people. I don't need. I'm like, show me where changing that will change the most. That's what I care about. That's it. And the Lord's like, I designed the entire church to be the solution. And if the church begins to become who she is called to be, it is the answer for all of the rest. So that's how I preach. I'm worried about us that, I mean, yes, affect the culture, all of that. But if the Lord rocks us the way he wants and gets us into the place, it will automatically flow out of that. Amen. So the foundation of the end time bride is not simply holiness. The foundation of the end time bride, listen to this, is lovesickness from which holiness overflows because it then jealously removes everything that hinders love. The ultimate holiness that we can have without our own righteousness that is as filthy rags to the Lord is receiving the right kind, which is really the only kind of love from him and having such a love sickness that grabs our hearts that rather than running around in guilt and shame, if I'm being holy enough, now all of a sudden it's me and the Lord making war on everything that is coming, trying to come between us and hinder love. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost for some marriages in here. I feel the Holy Ghost for some marriages in here. That some some people are like on opposite sides. Your issues are this and your issues are this because that's the way they do it with the Lord. Come on, we need to get honest in here. Or otherwise we're just coming to another service. That's the way we do it to the Lord is we're on opposite sides and trying to strive enough to be good enough instead of realizing that because of repentance, if I actually truly repent, that godly sorrow leads to repentance and the fruit of which is life. That if I've actually repented, that it's God right here and him and I, Mike Bickle says this, making war on our sin together because now all of a sudden we're in communion and everything that hinders love is the enemy. Welcome to holiness rooted in love. And I feel the Holy Ghost for some marriages in here. That some people are standing on opposite sides trying to yell to the other person what's wrong with them. And the Lord is saying, you need to learn how I partner with you so that you can do that together. So that the two of you can finally see the tactics of the enemy 
that you're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but principality and power get on the same side and begin getting rid of everything that hinders love. I feel the Holy Ghost on that. All right. Holy Spirit. Just pray for a second in the Holy Spirit. Just for a moment. God, I'm asking right now. For those in this room or online, God, I am asking, Lord, that just as Elijah asked, that the servant's eyes would be open to more than the natural. I'm asking that you would open spiritual eyes in some of the marriages right now. That they would see into the spirit realm of the enemy's tactics against their marriage. That they thought that they were just fighting with the other person. So could it be us see? But you would show where the enemy has been fighting and raging, trying to convince them it's just natural things with each other. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would open the eyes. And Father, that you would start to bring marriages together to war against the enemy in their marriages and in their families. God, I'm asking that you would give them some gumption again to get up and kick the enemy out of their marriage, out of their home. God, I'm asking, save some marriages. Thank you, God. All right. So we're finding as an end time bride, receiving his love that brings the love sickness from which holiness overflows because it then jealously removes everything that hinders love. We're just trying to put block after block. Our primary goal is not simply to become blameless. Listen to this. Mankind was blameless in the garden. Right? Before Genesis 3, Mankind was blameless in the garden. But they were not yet perfected in love. He could have had perfection from the beginning. It's the heart that chooses him above everything else that he's after. If the only thing, we're not pitting, if the only thing that he wanted was just blamelessness, only that, it's what he wants, but he wants it stacked on the right thing. If the only thing he wanted was that, he could have had that in the garden. It's the heart that chooses him above everything else that he's after. That's going to be the difference of mankind at the beginning versus mankind at the end. Blameless at the beginning, blameless at the end. But the difference is going to be mature love. That at the end says, now I have seen it all. And as a bride, we choose you. <clears throat> Y'all still with me? We're still building, believe it or not. We're n- we got more to get to before we actually really go for it. <laughs> I'm being nice at first. Y'all are like, what the? I got to go all of a sudden. All right. A natural example of how he does this. 
I love just working through the word. It's just all in there. It's so simple, but it's as he highlights it to us. Let's look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. This is really cool, very simple, but he gives a practical example, and it literally shows how the foundation get, gets built right in this passage. I know we've heard it probably a million times at weddings and all of that stuff, but I don't know that we've looked at it in this light. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, okay? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish, Then goes back to it. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Interesting. Do you see how the, how Jesus, or I'm sorry, how Paul, how the Holy Spirit through Paul gives literally, we just skip to whatever part is our favorite. We have a bent. That's how we, we read the word. And if we go through and highlight the word, go through where we've highlighted the word, most likely we will see we have gained the most revelation around the three or four aspects of God that we like the best. I mean, it's human nature. We like three or four the best. And most of the time, the sudden revelation we get usually are around those passages in verses, and it's typically because that's where our hearts are most open for the Holy Spirit to speak to us about it. Okay, too much. All right. (laughs) Y'all pray for my students, okay? Um, So usually it's kind of whatever. So if we're the holiness people, then yes, 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 he's going to get that spot and wrinkle and blemish out. And and amen, that's part of it. But I I think it's so beautiful because he gives such a practical thing, but he literally gives it in the steps in order that it has to be and how he expects it to be. Not to pick on it, but can I just mention for a second, husband's The Lord is giving, and this would go for wives too, but this is specifically just in this passage, addressing the husbands. The Lord is giving the building block of how change is supposed to come in to the home. My wife has this issue. My wife has that issue. If my wife would just change this issue. If my wife would just change that issue. But the Lord shows the husband how he deals with his own bride. Now, he's after holiness and blameless in the bride. But he does not go to her first demanding the holiness and the blamelessness. What does he say? Super simple. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, foundation laid. That, or you can say, so that, okay, so that word right there is showing us if the first part doesn't happen, you can just not even move on. Because these next parts aren't happening really until this foundational piece happens. Now it's Jesus talking about his bride and how he deals, but married couples, it's Jesus literally saying, I'm going to give you, we can say men or women, but specifically he's addressing husbands here. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost on this one too. He's addressing husbands here and saying, even though I'm God and I'm perfect, so I legitimately have a reason to expect blamelessness from my bride, even I don't start with blamelessness, demanding it. Even I start with the foundation of loving her 
and giving myself for her. And through that place, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, again, now that was another part. Now we're stepping into the last part. She should be holy and without blemish. And it's amazing. Out of all of that, what does he highlight? So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Jesus is laying a picture here, and he says, this is the way that I do it with my bride. Men, I'm letting you in on something. But he is showing us the correct order of relationship with him. He's like, do I want you blameless and holy in the end? Oh, absolutely. But I have a plan. I have a plan. And this is why, and I understand, listen, I understand because I get aversions to things that get polluted. So this is why the enemy has been slightly successful in some of the holiness movement to create an aversion to love because we know what the end goal of love is supposed to be. Amen? Legitimate. If the end goal does not lead to that place, then there is a reason why we feel a resistance in ourselves, right? But listen, what it doesn't mean is all of a sudden that we therefore toss out the foundations that Jesus laid, which Paul says those happen and nothing else gets built on it. It means that we see how he properly meant for it to be and get back to the real thing. Amen? When I was preparing, I, I heard the Lord say, and I wrote this down, I am looking for a people who receive my love and desperately long for me, not from a place of them frantically spinning their wheels to try and love me harder. Anyone ever felt that? but from a place of truly being baptized in my love. We ready to jump in now to the baptism of love? As I mentioned, I believe that the enemy has calculated a specific tactic causing part of the church to so accept such a culturally distorted definition of love and call it God's love that it has allowed him to cause the other part of the church, and I can't stand his ways. This is the same thing we just talked about in marriage, right? That it then causes the other part of the church who longs for holiness to often want to completely toss out the message of love. We might not say it, but in our hearts, it starts to build that aversion. The issue is that we begin to harden our hearts towards his greatest and most powerful tool for the church in the end times. You might not believe me, but I'm going to prove it to you. I believe the greatest end time baptism that is coming to the bride is a baptism of love sickness for him through a true fire of his love touching our hearts again. See, we've built this up to this is the main thrust of it. But I felt like if we just talked about this right at the beginning, instead of exposing the enemy's tactics and biblically seeing how the Lord put this in place, if we heard this right away, check out. Nope. Nope. I believe more than anything else that marks the end time church, that she is going to be so completely wrecked by his love, that she will be completely overtaken by the first and second commandment that becomes the catalyst for maturity in everything else. Where is this all heading? Let's make it real simple. We are going to be so in love with him from being so wrecked with his true love that we are finally going to choose him over everything else. That's the summary of a bride being prepared.
Am I going to lose some of y'all if I hit Song of Solomon? Well, Holy Ghost help. Song of Solomon 5, 4 through 8. This is a picture. I believe that there are parts of Song of Solomon, that it's a journey that basically shows. I know there's a natural interpretation. Some of you guys are like, whoa, you just lost me. I, I taught some of this to the students, and they, like, pick up the notes coming in, and they're like, oh, my gosh, have you lost your mind? And I'm like, no. So, well, maybe, but at least not in that area. Maybe on something else. Um, but I believe that outside of a natural interpretation, that there is a, uh, a spiritual reflection moving through the Song of Solomon that's basically showing from our immature state into our fully mature state in love, ready for the return of the bridegroom. So we're going to look at a few of those passages because I believe that some of these are the ones that actually prophesy a love that is coming that the church has actually never seen before. And if we can get gripped by the love that the Lord says that is coming to grip our hearts, then it will allow all the facades and all of the fake and all of those things to be put away. It'll rightly establish the foundation back in our hearts and prepare us to walk the path of being a bride that's ready to choose him above everything else. Amen? So let's look at one of these passages. Song of Solomon 5, 4 through 8. My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door, coming near her heart, and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leapt up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchman who went about the city found me. Listen to this. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall, church leadership, took my veil away from me. I charge you, O oh daughters of Jerusalem. This is her response. She literally, and I, I won't, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but um, going through even and listening to, as Mike Biggle, somebody that I, I don't know that there's anyone who has studied this more and gone into interpretations as the Bible interprets it and gone through this stuff. And, and he says that this represents the, the people on the walls and the watchmen, the keepers of the walls represents, it would represent our church leaders. She literally goes through all of this abuse, all of these things. And what is her response? I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am lovesick. We have cheapened, cheapened. No, no, no. We have allowed the enemy to so cheapen the love of God that though it's the very thing that cultivates holiness in our life, it's caused another section of the church to want to completely reject it. We have not experienced some of the levels that the word prophesies is coming to a last day's end time bride. Amen? And listen, when that happens, as a side note, in 5-9, the response of the people around her, they are so shocked that this is their response. How is your beloved better than others, most beautiful of women? How is your beloved better than others? So you charge us so. Okay, I know some people are like, you just totally lost me. It's all right. She comes to find the greatest obedience from a place of longing. Now, this isn't the beginning. There's another time where she, he tries to call her up, and she's like, mm, that's too scary. I'm not going there. It's a whole journey she goes through. No, that's too much. I'm staying in my comfort zone. She says, turn away from me. Turn away. Okay? And he's got to mature. She goes through some hard times. At this point, he comes near her, and she doesn't reject him. She starts going after him, and he withdraws to mature her and allow her to come after him 
not just instantaneously satisfying in the moment. It's part of the maturing process. Anyone ever felt that before? (laughs) It's part of our maturing process. And in it, she's in obedience, but she finds, it's amazing, the first time she loves him, but she's very immature in the love. So guess what? She's immature in the love, and she doesn't obey the call. But here, she grows into a place of lovesickness because earlier he starts pouring the way he sees her over her, his love over her, and as he does, it so captures her heart that even when he pulls away and she's abused by church leadership and everything goes wrong, it doesn't deter her. Because she's lovesick, and the lovesickness pulls her into radical obedience. Even the most hurtful and painful circumstances now have no hold on her because of her place of love. Causing others around her to marvel and want to know him the way she knows him. There is a baptism of love. I'm prophesying this to you that the word prophesies. There's a baptism of love that we have not even dreamt about before that's coming. And the Lord is going to have enough of the enemy's tactics of pitting some of these things against each other. And he's going to, I believe, bring a baptism of love of people whose hearts are really for him that's going to cause them to be able to obey in a way that they've talked about but never been able to actually do because it's not in the heart. Song of Solomon 8, 5. Who is this? I'm telling you guys, there is a prophecy in this book of an end time love that we have not seen that's coming. Song of Solomon 8, 5. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? Leaning upon her beloved. I have awakened you under the apple tree. The longing is meant to produce a leaning that brings an awakening. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. We're getting to the end of the book. She's getting mature in love. She's just gone through the big test of the wilderness because of the longing that we read about before. She hit it. First disobedience, then love sickness into more radical obedience, then fully into the wilderness, love sickness. Longing meant to produce a leaning that brings an awakening. I'm telling you, it's not just taking pieces of truth and randomly throwing them all up and hoping that the house comes out the right way. He gives the order and the steps. The end of Song of Solomon prophesies a baptism of God's love that brings a depth of the power of the Spirit that we, as the people of God, have yet to see. This this passage that I'm about to finish with is one that the Lord has gripped my heart with for years. Tammy, you, you and the team can come up has gripped my heart with for years, and I don't have understanding on it yet, but it has just gnawed at my spirit 
for a long time. It literally was the passage that started taking me into this journey of exposing the tactics of the enemy that, wait a second, he's, he's pitting what God has joined together. And Jeremiah mentioned this last night. We were saying it over marriages just a little bit ago. What God has joined together, the enemy is trying to pit against each other so that they're on opposite sides yelling at each other instead of they were never meant to be separated in the first place place. And when I started seeing this passage, it was the very thing that began to put a wrestle in me that said, we're missing something. Something is missing in our understanding of love. And this is what it really is. And we're going to read this passage in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is what it really is. It's that what we did is we allowed the culture to take over the definition of love and then began to fight against love itself, but the culture should have never have been the one to define it in the first place. The Lord said to me at one point, Sarah, it's fine to come against something that needs to happen sometimes, but the most powerful way to come against something, this is what the Lord said to me, is not actually to just directly go against it. It's to find the way the thing was meant to be in the first place and be it and then allow people to be drawn to it. So he's told me, you have a natural thing in you to reject something when it's not the way that it was meant to be. But the Lord said, but in your life, what I'm going to do more so than not is I'm going to cause you to dig for the way that the thing was meant to be. And instead of always yelling against what the world has made it, who is going to find the way that I created it to be and begin? to then show that to the world so there's actually power in it. So when I began to see this and look at it, something began to be bothered in my spirit. And for years, I've been asking the Lord and praying into it. And this is what I believe that the Lord wants to inject into us in this room, but even into an end time movement that I'm like, Lord, I have not seen this in all of these ways that we're fighting against things. Meanwhile, your word prophesies that there is a type of love that we've never seen before and father I'm asking as we're standing against the culture that there would also be a people that would become obsessed with the things that you're obsessed with finding the way that you meant for them to be in the first place and so we can actually get this thing moving instead of just yelling at each other all the time am I the only one Listen, I I did that when I was younger, just yelled all the time about things until I was like, the the problem with that is, is yeah, I can get mouthy with stuff, but the problem that it is, is I also actually love fruit and efficiency and it drives me nuts when something just goes in circles and never actually gets anywhere. I'm like, well, then I might as well shut up. Lord, he actually, well, that might be offensive to people. Lord told me when I was complaining about the church all the time in my 20s. He said, yeah, you see something wrong with the church? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Let me give you my list, you know. Because God needs me to tell him. He needs my help with that. So I, I did. I was helping him out. And he was like, uh-huh. He's like, so does the world. And this might be offensive to you, but I, I know he loves me, so it's okay. He said, why don't you shut up until you can do something about it? I'm tired of just arguing only with wrong love. I want to find the root of what the word prophesies and see the Lord bring it into a last day's movement. You guys ready to see the passage? All right. Song of Solomon 8, 6, and 7. Interestingly enough, this is directly after the verses that we just read about who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. I wakened you under the apple tree. 
verse six to seven says this, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love, who, guys, I'm telling you, if we as the church can find this kind of love, we're not gonna have an issue constantly trying to bicker about all the other stuff. It's gonna take care of it. For love is as strong as death. Where is, this is what has been bothering me for years. Lord, this is not the love I'm hearing about, seeing, or even seeing in my own life. What is this love, Lord? How can you baptize me and your church and your end time bride in this being the fruit of love? For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it out. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. We're trying to fight evil and amen. We're trying to do all that. We're trying to get people holy. We're trying to all this kind of stuff. So weak to a certain aspect and I put myself in that. Meanwhile, fighting, sometimes even in our own hearts, not realizing it, against love, because we've gone ahead and accepted that whatever the world says it is, it is. And literally allowing the enemy to move in his tactics because he knows that an end time church that gets baptized in the true reality of what love is, will be able to literally overcome death. Listen, I want healing. I want the Lord to move in signs and wonders. I want all of those things. But where is this love? That's next level. The Lord has been speaking to me for several years that there is a revelation of this love spoken of in the word that the church has yet to know that he is bringing. It is not defined by the weakness of culture, nor is it hardened by holiness without love, but it is love defined by God, where we rather than pride, rather than in pride or mouthiness, we are leaning, which is full humility and tenderness and yet through it carry the greatest power the church and world has ever seen. Able to completely stomp out the greatest powers of darkness and evil. Can we put that verse back up there? Leave it there a second. We're just gonna leave, let's just leave it up there. We're trying to run in circles fighting darkness. We're trying to run in circles fighting on Facebook. We're trying to run in circles, all of these kinds of things. And I'm telling you, this is the end of the book and it's prophesying that she's gonna come out with a tenderness, with a humility, with love, we, we don't wanna do that because we feel like we're just cowering to everything. Guys, we gotta start thinking the way that God thinks. Our weakness, his strength, not our bootstraps. We're trying to do all of these things, running in circles, feeling good that we've said something and nothing's happening. Can we just get honest? Nothing's happening. Nothing's changing. It's really not doing anything. Nobody changed their minds because of everything that we said. But in the middle of it, he literally is listing the most unnatural things possible. Many waters cannot quench 
the fire of this love. That's not natural. He's saying you can dump everything that you can possibly dump on it, it's not going to go anywhere. The strongest things, as strong as death, the greatest evils, the most demonic things in the earth, it is going to have power while she's leaning. This is the way of the kingdom. It makes no sense. She's leaning. She's limping. She's in humility and her heart is tender. Yet, don't mistake that. Because the baptism of love is going to crush the most demonic things. And when the worst things in life come, that will increase. It will basically be laughed at and not even touch the flame. This is the greatest marking of the end time bride. This is the baptism the Lord is longing to pour out that will produce holiness and the power of the spirit that is unrivaled to stand in the difficulty to come. If you've ever been in the place of serious breaking, you quickly realize regardless of my discipline, regardless of my ability to pick myself up by my own bootstraps, I I don't, I can't do it. There's a reason why we're supposed to be going through this right now. We're supposed to be learning. Learning. Tenderness and humility so that an inexplicable fire of his love can baptize us to where we may look weak to the world, but death is being crushed. Every demonic and evil thing has no chance. And every thing that can beat us, every wave and every ounce of water that comes to quench it doesn't even touch it. We close our eyes and wait on the Holy Spirit for a moment. and there's a love that the Lord is wanting to bring that so heals the heart that all of the hurt from church leadership come on I feel like the Lord pricked some people's hearts with that statement she found a longing it doesn't make it okay does not make it okay. But she found something in the Lord. An introduction into the baptism of his love. That even all of the ways of man mistreating her, of church leaders, of all of these other things, It did not derail her or deter her in her quest of love. I feel like there are some people in the room where the enemy has tried to use the tactics of people to send your heart into circles. It's almost like you were on a path and you were going somewhere and you hit something. Wrong things done to you that's not okay with the Lord. 
wrong treatment by fellow believers, church leaders. And it has had you in a cycle where you feel like you've been spinning your wheels maybe for years and you've not been able to get out. If that's you and you feel like the Lord's tugging on your heart, would you stand online? If that's you, would you begin to tune in and pray into the Spirit for a moment? Come on, the Lord wants to baptize us in His love. But we're going to have to get bare before Him and real. If we want to get out of the games, out of the circles, out of the... We've got to come from behind the leaves and trees in Genesis. Hiding and acting like putting the leaves over those places of shame. Is actually hiding ourselves from the Lord when He comes looking and calling for us. If there's somebody around you, would you just reach out your hand towards them? Come on, we're going to be family in here tonight. If it's appropriate or you feel led, you can put a hand on them. God, I'm asking that you would begin to bring a baptism of your love right now. I feel like the Lord is saying to some people, it wasn't okay. And that for some, the reason why they are struggling in that circle and cycle is because they feel that if they move on, then they're saying that what was done to them and the behaviors that were done to them is okay. And I feel like the Lord is saying tonight, it wasn't okay for some of you. The Lord says, when you know my love, you know how I cherish you. You know how I value you. You know how I fight for your heart. You know how precious and how dear it is to me. But the Lord says, I have something even greater for you than hanging on to the pain that makes you feel like it wasn't okay. That there is a baptism of my love that sets you free. And brings you into a level of joy and life like you've never known before. That in the in my presence is fullness of joy, and at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. And my asking you to give it up on is not for you to say that it was right, but it's to bring you out of the mire of where the enemy has had you stuck and bring you into the fullness of my love and fullness of my life and fullness of my joy. Listen as the Holy Spirit begins to move on you. And 
give you strength and, and comfort your heart and coax you and woo you into, into his love. I want you to genuinely in your heart release, 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 release. Let's do it right now. If you feel the Holy Spirit on that, begin to whether you need to speak it out loud. If you're in your living room, go ahead and begin to even say it out loud. And begin to release it to the Lord. Shura ba 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 ye. Hora ma 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 ye. Hiri a da 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 da. He says, "I see you now, and I saw you then." Hiri a da 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 ba da 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 da. So, and I didn't do it to you, but I'm coming for you. Hiri a da 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 ba so. Hiri a da 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 ba si ki a da 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 da. And God, I'm asking that you would bring a baptism of your love. I'm asking right now that you would begin to move into hearts. People in living rooms right now that have felt stuck in drudging in mud for years, that you would begin to release a baptism of your love. I'm asking in this room that people would feel like that they could take a breath for the first time in years and feel the mountain cool breeze of the Holy Spirit fill their lungs and release them and loose them from the circles and the mud of the enemy in Jesus name life back in the lungs air and breath again Come on. Wind blow right now into those lungs. New breath and new life. Breathe the breath of the Holy Spirit. Loose freedom in this place. Yes, come on. Chains are coming off of some people. Come on. There's nothing that compares to his love. There is no death that can overcome his love. Hey. You may have tried everything else. Hey. But you haven't tried the baptism of the death of the enemy. Hey, Shorabaye, Siki Andarabaso, Shiki Andarabas, Siki Arabaso, Hiri Andereyaso, Yah, Soramande Araba, Shoramande Reyasi, Horabasi. Man, I feel something powerful going on with some people. I mean, I feel like some people are literally going to be waking up tomorrow feeling physically in their lungs like they can breathe freer than they've ever breathed in years since before a certain instance. Release it. 
Release it. Release it. Loose it. Let the bridegroom king come in and minister to that heart. Let him care for it. Let him bring the baptism of his love. As the Lord continues to minister to some people on that, I felt something else that the Holy Spirit was asking some people to respond to, maybe even more than the first. I felt like the Lord was telling me, even as I was seeking Him, that there are some of us that have allowed our hearts to become hardened in the name of truth. That there are some that we've allowed our heart to become hardened in the name of standing for truth. Leaning on her beloved was what led to the baptism of this kind of love. And I felt like the Lord said, I need to tenderize the soil of some hearts again. It doesn't mean we don't love him. It doesn't mean that we're not passionate and zealous for who he is. And we want his things first. And all of those things, well-meaning. But we didn't realize in the process that our hearts have actually grown hardened, which is an aversion to the baptism of his love. So I'm asking in here, online, if that's you that's saying, I know that I love him, but whether it's the darkness of the enemy that I feel I've been fighting or the waves of things in life hitting me over and over. And I know that my, my heart has gotten a certain amount of hardness in it. I'm not as tender anymore. I can feel, just close your eyes for a moment. That you would say, I can feel that the tenderness that was once there, it's not as tender anymore. There's some jadedness in certain areas. There's some hardness where I used to be softer and more tender. Even being a little harsher towards people and all of a sudden I realize I'm not quite as tender towards the Lord. Again, it doesn't mean we don't love him. We may have felt very zealous for him, but the Lord cares about what seems small to us because he says, you don't realize how much tenderness matters to me. It's when, it's the whole reason I put her in the wilderness so she would learn to lean. Humility and tenderness, she would learn to lean because when she was in that place, I was able to bring a baptism of my love. If that's you, if you feel my heart isn't as tender as it once was, there's some jadedness, there's some hardness that has come for whatever reason. Would you stand? Come on again, let's get real before the Lord. Let's get real before Him. Sometimes it's even easier. Again, this is not me. I'm not even opening my eyes. I have no idea who's standing or not right now. I'm just talking what I'm feeling in my spirit. Sometimes it's easier to stand up for things that people have done to ourselves than it is for some of the small things of the heart that were meant in zeal for him. But the word of God so prioritizes this. Would it be so sad to not be positioned 
to receive this beautiful love prophesied that is yet to come to an end time bride. Because over time and situations, there's a small hardness that's begun to creep into our hearts. you just put out your hands connect with the Lord a moment Tammy I'm going to ask you and the team for in a second to sing over us the tender places the Lord wooing our hearts reminding us of our first love tenderizing those places where some of that hardness has creeped in and as they do this asking you would go into that place with the Lord you would open it up and allow him to sing over you allow him to wash you just as he said with the bride that he comes and he loves and then he begins to wash her with the water of the word that you would allow a mix of his love and the washing with the water of the word to just begin to wash over and tenderize our hearts again. Team, would you go ahead and sing? Come away, come away, come away. Come away, come away, come away. Come away with me again. Return to me with all your of circumstances wash off open Open to me again Receive receive my love I don't want anyone else I don't need anything else yes you are my one can we sing this to the Lord together the harshness away. The harshness of life that have brought the harshness of the tongue. He's washing it away with longing.
God, I'm asking tonight for your baptism of love. Lord, in my own life, being on this journey, I long to see what you've prophesied. A bride so in love with you that all the darkness and hell, all the circumstances of life literally, literally can't even get her caught up in all other things. But that in the very pursuit of love, all of those things get squashed at the end. This is the baptism that you have for your bride that brings the holiness and the move of the spirit that your word prophesies. God, we ask in this room tonight and in this movement, baptize us with your love. Baptize us with a love that's so supernatural and incredible that it literally causes those around us who have tried and seen everything else. Who is this beloved? That in all that's happened to you, this would be the words on your mouth. Where is he? I long for him sign and a wonder to the world around us. God, baptize us in your love, we pray. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that the message that you just received challenge you and encourage you. I do want to go into a time of prayer, but before I do that, I want to give you an opportunity to sow a one-time gift into our ministry. Uh, there's gonna be a number pop up on your screen, a link in the comment section, or if you're desiring to do something further, you know, so many people around the world desire to participate with the Ultra Global Movement. We'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. That link is also gonna be down in the comment sec section being a part of our partner family. Let's pray now. God, thank you for those who have watched today, who you've refreshed and challenged and encouraged. Lord, we lift up the prayer requests. We lift up the gifts, the partners that are even joining right now. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in the earth. You're readying your bride for your coming. You're bringing in a harvest of souls. And Lord, you're touching even the prayer requests being offered right now. We just ask all these things in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you so much.